Thank you so much for watching the film. Um, very happy to answer any questions about you know where we are with us with police reform now with stop and frisk. Uh, anything about the nature of the film or you know any questions anyone has? So it premiered about a year ago at a film festival at the IFC Center in the in Greenwich Village uh, called Doc NYC. It's actually a festival that's starting next week. Um, it's shown at a bunch of different festivals. I think we've had a couple dozen, maybe a few dozen screenings um, at various universities, law schools. Um, you know, the International Center of Photography did a screening. The Robin Hood Foundation did a screening. The Vera Institute for Justice this summer. It's kind of moving around. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I ended uh, the film with Brad and kind of coming back. Uh, who? You know, he was the architect of Broken Windows back in the 90s. He was really the architect of Stop and Frisk. Um, and to a large extent, Broken Windows seems like Stop and Frisk by another name. Um, and there was some interesting data that came out um, in kind of the first six months, after about six months of the uh, de Blasio administration, where we saw, you know, Stop and Frisk kind of plummeted officially, but the numbers of summons and misdemeanors actually stayed the same. So a lot of those summonses and misdemeanors are converted stops. So one can kind of infer from that data that perhaps the stops are still happening at a, uh, at a similar level. They're simply not being recorded, um, which, you know, from focus groups and personal experience, some people have, uh, you know, confirmed or at least suggested that that's going on. Um, and then just very quickly, the kind of the ideology behind broken windows which is that we prevent criminality by um, you know, attacking these small quality of life crimes that Stop and Frisk was supposed to be targeting as well. You know, is not one that I endorse and I'm not sure is one that actually plays out from a criminological perspective. That, that people that uh, commit quality of life crimes like uh, fair beating or drinking on a stoop, these are not really um, the criminals we need to be worried about in the city, at least from my perspective. I mean, I think one big step they, that could be done is simply accountability. I mean, when police officers break the law, they should be held accountable, and they're just simply not. So, I mean, that would be a very obvious um, measure. Another one would be to stop, um, to eliminate quotas, you know, to not force police officers to make a certain number of arrests every month, or at least to lower that number that's considered reasonable, um, which are things that actually have nothing to do with training. It's, a, you know, Polanco, he, he expresses a lot of times, he feels there's a lot of pressure on police officers to hit numbers that are not necessarily um, desirable and that often, you know, create perverse incentives for these officers. It has nothing to do with training but this kind of pressure from above. Is there some sort of law or ordinance that says it's an offense not to be carrying identification? No, definitely not. Though oftentimes, what happens a lot of the time is if people are arrested and they don't have identification, they can hold you until they've ascertained your identity. But you have to commit a crime for that to happen, theoretically. But I can't walk down the street yes. without identification. Definitely. As long as you don't commit a crime or you're not arrested. <laughs> So there's been a bunch of uh, pilot programs around this. Um, it's kind of a big open question. We're getting some pretty awful body camera footage from around the nation now that police officers are carrying them. One of the big issues actually, and, and the Center for Constitutional Rights is in a big kind of dispute with the NYPD over this right now, is that right now, so they're doing some pilot programs where police officers are carrying body cameras, but the footage just goes to the police department and there's no outside observer. So if the police department's protecting their officers and they don't share the footage, what's the point, really? Um, if it's open and public footage, then yeah, it'll probably have some deterrent effect, I imagine. Well, actually, so a really, a, re a really scary program of the NYPD right now that's not getting a lot of press is they are x-raying vans around New York City um, at pretty high frequencies. That's upset some people because they're worried about uh, carcinogenic effects. So they are currently x-raying us. I mean, this is the problem. There's, you know, it's this kind of deep-seated problem of accountability 
for police actions that's countrywide, in a sense. I mean, as we saw with Eric Garner, as we saw with Mike Brown, as we saw with a lot of um, different cases, uh, there's really been prosecutions um, for, you know, supposed alleged criminality on the part of police. I mean, the case of murders committed by the police. Um, and it would be preferable, at least, if these things would at, even at least go to trial. I mean, that what's, what's kind of stunning is not only that they're not indictments coming down or that they're indictments, but they just never even reach a trial phase, phase where evidence would be weighed. Um, so that seems to me a serious issue for reconsideration. Um, yeah, and perhaps we would need laws, laws to do that, but a lot of it's policy too. Yeah. Sometimes I was told to move away. Sometimes, I mean, I, um, sometimes I just pretend to be a tourist basically and walked up to them and was like, hey, can I film you? Like, NYPD. <laughs> uh, so then they were fine with it. Um, obviously, you know, you saw that one stop that I caught on film up in Harlem. And I only, I only have one scene where the police officer is yelling at me, but he was yelling at me quite a, quite a bit in a pretty menacing manner. And then um, actually the guy who's talking most of the time, uh, like, you know, Rose to my defense, he's like, hey, he has the right to film. Like, what's going on? And they got in this big argument, which is just not in the film because, uh, you know, there was no place for it there. Um, but I don't know. You know, in some ways you could say I don't fit the description. So it's easier for me to film than perhaps uh, a lot of cop watch teams that go around that have gotten into trouble. Um, I think it stems from the fact that prosecutors have to bring these indictments and the prosecutors not only work very closely with police officers, but they rely on the police officers for evidence for all their cases. So they're very, very reluctant to either bring indictments against police officers and when they bring indictments to, um, to produce the sort of evidence that would lead to a trial. Um, and it's a very funny situation. I mean, indictments are, and grand juries are kind of a joke in uh, criminal law. I mean, the, you know, the old phrase is that uh, a good prosecutor could indict a ham sandwich. Basically, you don't actually need a lot of evidence to show that there are triable issues of fact, um, which, which would let one go to trial. So that's why it's shocking that they're not going to trial. Trial is a much different standard. Trial is a standard of reasonable doubt, especially for crime, which is a very high standard. So I wouldn't necessarily be surprised if a lot of these matters, these murders, these crimes were going to trial and then people weren't convicted, because it's hard to convict. But to not even get past the grand jury shows that there's uh, deep flaws in our system. So you're, you're free to film police officers. You're free to film public servants as long, in the law states, as long as you don't interfere with an ongoing police investigation or arrest. They can ask you to stand back. Um, there was a big controversy, I forget the name of the basketball player whose leg was broken. Sorry? Yes. Um, because he, you know, he was essentially asked to stand back, but they kind of kept pushing him farther and farther and farther back to the point which there was no way he was interfering with the investigation, and then they broke his leg. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of those situations where they can have you stand back a reasonable distance, but they can't push you, uh, you know, half a mile out of the way. Um, for private individuals, you don't have the right to film without their permission. I know people are supposedly have uh, to wear what they want, but why do they wear the hoods when they know there's trouble wearing those hoods at night? So, you know, I mean, I would flip that question and ask, why we should live in a society where people have to adhere to certain dress codes to not be harassed by the police. Um, and actually, I've talked about this with David on a lot of occasions. So the protagonist in the film, you know, you see David's father and you see David and you see what he wears and he can, you know, he can also put on his suit and a tie and he does it when he goes to court. But I mean, his kind of stated view is that he doesn't want to adhere to these, um, norms that are imposed by the threat of police violence. That uh, doesn't make sense to him and that, you know, we should be able to live in a society that where people dress diversely and that should not be a cause for harassment. But it is. Right. So for him it's actually, you know, in some ways a political gesture that he doesn't want to adhere to these to these norms and that he doesn't feel like he should be harassed. Um, for other people they probably just don't even think about it.
it's just how people dress. So I have two responses to that. I mean, you know, one is a kind of goes actually the structure of the film that probably you know is and it, you know it seems to end at several different points and then it kind of continues because uh, you know the nature of these reforms and the nature of uh, you know this political struggle one could say goes on I mean there's no you don't you don't win the court case and then everything happens I mean officer Polanco said it best where he said well the NYPD is a kingdom you know it's a it's it's a behemoth um, and it's going to take a while to change um, and these reforms take a really long time to go into place so you know we're about a year and a half since the final intervention was dropped in the Floyd case, and they're just now beginning to roll out their initial pilot programs. They've, uh, you know, they've reformed training for the incoming classes. They've rewritten the police manuals. There's a monitor in place, um, but you know, we have officers. Most of the police force was trained under a very different philosophy. I mean, they were trained in the 90s and 80s. They were trained under broken windows. They're not going to change without, I, I think, accountability. Um, and, you know, they're very well protected and they're a very powerful group in uh, New York City life and that makes them um, somewhat, um, you know, both reluctant to change and kind of protected from, from change. But, you know, I also hope and I also feel there's been a national discussion around around policing, around police violence, around reform, um, you know, especially embodied by the Black Lives Matter movement um, that, you know, commenced about a year ago. And I'm hoping that some of this leads to change. Um, but essentially speaking, um, individuals and communities have to keep the pressure on because it's not going to change by itself. And you know all of these all these things that we've seen the um, the Community Safety Act the the Floyd case they're just steps in a very uh, long process um, you know for which I'm 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 actually somewhat hopeful uh, but we will you know we will say I've never been convinced I've never seen convincing evidence that the theory that underlines broken windows that by chastening or arresting people talking in halls or spitting gum on the streets leads to reductions in, in violent crime, which is what we're really concerned about. I mean, we're concerned about murders, we're concerned about robberies, we're concerned about, you know, these really damaging acts to society. And there's never, again, for me, I've never seen convincing proof that there's actually a connection between those two acts and these kind of the broken windows tends to, um, you know, tends to be a euphemism for harassment, oftentimes of marginalized communities or poorer communities. Um, I mean, that's where the police presence is um, is concentrated. Um, the reason why, I mean, it, it was a great tragedy that these two officers were killed. The reason why I wouldn't include them in the film is that. So stop and frisk and broken windows and all these things are government policies. They're state policies that, um, you know, for better or worse, uh, interact, interact with citizens and they're, 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 they're political, they're systematic. The, um, the murder of the two police officers was by a private citizen um, who was clearly rather deranged. Um, and it was a kind of individual act, and I'm more interested in how politics, how legislation, how state policy um, interacts with individuals in this film. And I just feel like that would that would turn it into into um, something that the film's not about. That's well, or, you know, let's let's just say. I mean, I, I'm not sure if it turns people into criminals, but let's say they don't want to help the police. And actually, I mean, as you, you know, this is the nature. This is the subject of the film. When when people are in trouble, they don't want to. They don't want to go to the police. Uh, they don't want to call for help. Um, you know, somebody at one of the screenings said uh, there was a saying in her community that. Um, you know, when, you're, when a crime happens, you're in trouble, and then, you know, if you call the police, you're in even more trouble, <laughs> basically. So, and that's not a sentiment that we want to foster in society, because it also impedes investigation, impedes, um, 
impedes community togetherness, impedes the entire sense of us of belonging and living together.